How's everybody doing? Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Let's, let's get this started. So first and foremost, I'm Che Pope, uh, originally from Boston, Massachusetts, now living in Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here, um, to speak here at Login. Uh, I was approached about it a year ago by some gentlemen in the front row that I know. Um, and, they, and they asked me would I be interested in coming to share. And, you know, I had to think about it. Um, because it's just like you guys are, are taking your businesses global. It's the same thing. It's still for me to even come here and share. It's like, okay, is this something I'm, you know, I'm ready for? Um, I've spoken all around the world and on different subjects and so on and so forth. But this is something that's near and dear to my heart. So today I'm going to speak about sort of like the, the synthesis of, of, of fashion, music, and tech, where it all comes together in business and, and where the worlds collide. But first of all, I want to tell you guys a little bit about, about me. Um, I think you guys know a lot about the people I work with, but you might not know so much about me. So I'm going to start there. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I've been, I'm a music producer first and foremost. I've been a music producer for 23 years now. I've won a Grammy, I've done all those kind of things, I've scored movies, I've, I've been fortunate to travel the world um, many times actually, you know, on the strength of being, doing music. And it's been, it's been a great journey. Um, you know, I wouldn't trade this life for anything. Um, but I started, I was a finance major in college. And music was a hobby. Music was something that I did for fun. And business was something, was, was what I was interested in, was my passion. So going into the music business was kind of by, just by luck, it just by happenstance. And it was great because little did I know I was learning to become an entrepreneur, which was, which was always my goal, you know, from, from childhood. Um, so when you first start out in the music business, especially if you're an, uh, in, an independent music producer, which I was, it's, a, it's the equivalent of, of starting your own startup. You're this independent, you know, you're, you have this business that you're starting, that you have to go solicit all these people and try to find someone to, you know, take your music, take your product, you know, and then, and then you grow your business and so on and so forth based on the success of one product, hopefully expand your territories. So, without realizing it, I was becoming an entrepreneur early on. Um, so it was great. So I, let me give you a little quick history. I started out, I worked with this guy named Teddy Riley, who gave me my first deal. I don't know how much you guys know about Teddy Riley, but he's the guy that produced Michael Jackson, uh, Bobby Brown, you know, and countless others. He gave me my first deal. He also gave uh, Tim, uh, the Neptunes, their first deal. So he, he, he brought a lot of people through his doors and gave a lot of opportunities. And that was a great starting point because it taught me how to make a song and it taught me how to, you know, sort of hone my craft. And then I started working with this guy you guys might all know as Puffy or Diddy or um, whatever his name is these days. Um, he was always... You know, I think it was great working with him because he's someone that early on saw the influence of culture on business. He saw the influence of culture to sell products. He saw the influence of the music, you know, and the artist and, and the influence that they had on, um, you know, just that it was a viable product, that it was more than just the music. He saw that it was clothing and he went on to do, you know, countless other businesses from liquor to clothing to this to that. But he was one of the people that saw it early on. And I think that's why he's done so well as a businessman. Because even back then, before he ever did it, he talked about doing it. You know, I can remember like 1995, being in a hotel room with a guy, 1993 maybe, actually 93. And the guy literally talking about, I'm gonna sell clothes, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna sell car rims, I'm gonna sell this, all off the, all off the influence of what the music did. Um, 
I went from there, I worked with, uh, I worked with the Fugees, uh, Destiny Child, which is best, uh, Beyonce. Um, I worked with Lauryn Hill, that was my first big record. I got a Grammy for that. Um, then I started, that's when my, after the Lauren record is when I started changing courses a little bit. So I'd always been just a music producer. And then I was like, okay, I need to know more about this business. So that's when I became an executive as well. And I wanted to know more about the business from that side of the table. I think any business you're in, you should know all aspects of it, you know. So meaning if you're a designer, you should still have an understanding of marketing. If you're a marketer, you should still have an understanding of design and things of that nature. So, long story short, I started working at Warner Brothers Records and I started really learning a lot about the business of music. When you're just a music producer, you just care about the song and you're just truly really trying to finish a great song. And when you're, when you're working for a record label, you're trying to find, you know, it's like you're a venture capitalist. You're trying to find the next, the next great talent you're trying to develop it, and you're trying to blow it up and then market it around the world, and you, know, and you make this product. So I started on that journey at Warner Brothers, and that was 1999. Um, eventually, that led me to this guy named Dr. Dre. Um, I moved to LA. I was in New York for years, and then I moved to LA. I started working with Dr. Dre, um, who's, as you know, the founder of Beats. Um, him and another guy named Jimmy Iovine, who ran Interscope Records. Um, and that was great because I was actually, prior to, prior to Beats, and I'll get into Beats later, but I was able to sort of be a fly on the wall in like, this is like maybe 2004, 2005, of hearing these guys who've had tremendous success in the music business talk about what's next. And I was able to be a fly on the wall for these conversations. And Fast forward to now, for the last five, six years, I've been working with Kanye West. Um, every day is a new day, like every day is a new surprise. Um, Kanye is everything that you think he is and more. Um, it's, he is who, exactly who you see in the press. He's that guy. But, he, but he's, a, he's a really great guy to work with. And, um, and it really ties back into this conference because he's a guy that is really He's about disruption. He's about forward thinking. He's about, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit. He's, um, and that's, what, that's one of the reasons I ended up wanting, wanting to work with him because I, I was at a place where I needed a challenge, where I was looking towards my future and I wanted to challenge myself. And he was definitely a challenge. And it's been great. It's been great. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster, but it's been great. So now I want to tie it back into wh why we're all here. Um, so I was in a bar last night. I just got in like at midnight last night and I, I met someone and they were like, you know, why are you here? And I said, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak tomorrow. And they're like, well, why would you come here to speak? Of all the places you could go, why would you come here? It's so small. Like, would it, how is that important to you and your business? It's such a small market and so on and so forth. And so... I never even thought about it like that. I thought about it, and first and foremost, the reason that I was drawn to this area is there's an amazing company called Vinted that um, a really good friend of mine put on my radar. And same as in the music business, I'm just drawn to talent. I'm just really, I just want to, you know, it's like if you, if, you, if you know someone that's really talented and amazing, you want to tell people about them. You want people to know about them. And so that's why, you know, I discovered this company, Vinted, um, uh, which was founded here in Lithuania um, by a 26-year-old woman, Milda, and her partner, Eustace. And they, 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 cre they had this great idea. And, you know, they partnered with Mantis, and they, and they created this, this business that what, just, from, just from hearing the idea alone, I wanted to be involved because I knew it was a, I knew it was a global idea. And... It doesn't, to me, it's not about where you're at or where you're from. It's about, you know, what, you know, you know, what your idea is, what can, you can do with it. You know, um, it doesn't, I'll go to the ends of the earth to speak, to participate, to, you know, it's, it's nothing to get on a plane and come somewhere, you know. Um, so 
to answer the person last night, I was just, I was like, well, this is a great opportunity. I was like, because there, you know, I want to see if there are more brilliant minds here, more brilliant ideas, you know, to come discover, to come find, to come help illuminate to the world, you know. Um, I think that's my talent is that I can find talent and then I can network talent. I can bring people together, you know, and, I, and, I, and that's what I do. So I want to start off first with sort of saying a little bit about, you know, my experiences in business. And I've been part of a couple of amazing things and amazing journeys that were really organic and they really came about in a, um, it, it was, it's, it's, it's funny when you start something and you're a part of something and you never know where it's going to take you, this road, because there's, and, the, and not saying there's anything wrong with the different paths people take, but some people take the path where they, you know, they go to college, they, they get a good job, they come home every day, there's nothing wrong with that. But then there's the people that are, you know, they have the ideas, and, 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 and you may get laughed at, you may get, you know, ridiculed, you know, you may have to talk to 100 people before you get one to really listen. You know, that's the tough path. The, the, the tough path is to go down that road to build something from scratch that's, you know, a new idea that you believe in and to get others to believe in and so on and so forth. So we were, um, we were in the studio sitting around one day and Dre was sort of looking to what's next. What's the next opportunity um, outside of music? Because music wasn't selling the way it was. This is... This is probably around 2005. Music wasn't what it was. Eminem wasn't doing that great. 50 Cent wasn't, was on the decline. So it was kind of like, in his world, it was like, what's next? Okay, and so when you're in the rap business, people come at you with a clothing line. They come at you with a liquor. There's a lot of, a lot of like these celebrity deals, or if you will, and the stereotypical things. So Dre's not your atypical type of guy. So. We came up with, he came up with this idea to do speakers, which ended up being headphones. Um, I named the company Beats by Dre. And it was literally something that I probably, you know, when you're just sitting around and you're just, you know, playing with ideas, you don't ever think of the global magnitude that something may one day be. You know, there was a, the premium headphone market was at best a very nominal market. There was, you know, at the time people were consuming headphones that were paid, you know, say 50 bucks, 70 bucks. Companies like Bose dominated the headphone market. It wasn't really something where it was like, the, you know, we see this tremendous opportunity. But one thing we did know is that we knew we were connected to the artist. We knew that we were connected to influencers. So we knew that if we created this product, that we could get it to the influencers, and then we would just see what happened from there. So we knew that we would create a tidal wave. So the initial strategy, which was, you know, when you launch a new product, the biggest expense you usually have is marketing. This is where, the, with Beats by Dre, the experiment was a little bit different, because we knew we could actually market this product very, very cheaply, very inexpensively. It was barely any money spent to launch this product. What we did is we gave it to athletes, we gave it to artists, we put it in videos, you know, we let people wear it around as accessories, so we gave them free product. But before you know it, in the paparazzi shots, you saw Beats by Dre headphones. In videos, you saw the headphones. Athletes going to their games, you saw them wearing the headphones. Before you knew it, with just Without knowing it, they were everywhere. You were seeing them everywhere, and it created this demand. It created this. So we, we took the approach of let's create a headphone, but let's make it a fashion accessory. Let's make it something more than what it's normally seen as. You know, you had this product that people envisioned it one way. Well, we envisioned it a, a whole multitude of ways. We knew that we could make it an accessory. We knew that we could make it a part of your everyday lifestyle. The same way Steve Jobs saw that the iPhone would be your everyday accessory. You know, we knew that this was an opportunity for that. So that's the way the, the, the sort of the company was born out of and that's the way the sort of company was built. 
It was built more on the culture and using the enter, you know, entertainment and celebrities and, and, and that's not, every product is not great for that, but that was great for that product. And then there was a lot of, um, it's funny, because then, then we got into the technical side of it where there was a lot of criticism. The, the, the headphones had more bass in them. Um, so, but, but then we, you know, the idea behind the headphones is like, well, who are we making them for? You know, a lot of the idea is a lot of the music, you know, we know everyone's listening to music. A lot of it is MP3s. MP3s is a, is a, it's a very um, smushed down version of, of a track. Normally when we mix a track down, you know, it's, we'd love for it to be heard in its true natural form, but that's not the reality with the internet. So what happens is things get smushed to MP3 format because it's easily shareable and therefore the quality is not the same. So what we wanted to do with Beats is we wanted that everyone had it with, in their grasp just a really good listening experience. So even if you were listening on an iPod, your cell phone, whatever you're listening to, you could still hear it sounding alive, like more like it was truly meant to sound from the studio to your headphones. So with that said, it wasn't necessarily for the audio files, but it was for, it was for the people that were consuming them, you know. And then obviously, then we did the things of, of customizing in terms of colors and making them unique, making it a fashion accessory, really making it a desired thing. And I think what, what I learned, especially from that was, because now Beats is 70% of the headphone market, where before it would have been a success had it been only 10% of the headphone market, it would have been a success. Now it's 70% of the market. It sold for 2.6 billion, as everyone knows, to Apple and so on and so forth. It's now, it's a, it's now, it's like a, you know, almost like a fixated part of culture now, you know. And this started in a recording studio in the Valley in L.A., where people just, you know, same thing, just sitting around, playing around with ideas, you know. And ten years later, it's a billion, multi, you know, multi-billion-dollar company. And it showed me the power of influence. It showed me the power of, of how, what an idea can be. And then, you, you know, you, you take an idea, you expand it, you, and then you continue to expand it. And, and, and then you make it a global thing. It wasn't early on with Beats. It, it immediately was a campaign to go to Brazil. It was to go to Europe, to go, you know, to go to Scandinavia, to go to Asia. That was an early part of the, of the strategy. So it wasn't like, oh, let's make it just a U.S. thing, and then if it blow, does well there. Even before it was successful in the U.S., it was already the strategy was to go in global. So tying that into, you know, the opportunities that I think exist, um, and I use Vinted as a good example because I was amazed that this 26-year-old woman with an idea was able to attract these major, major venture capitalist firms. There's three major venture capitalist firms that invested in Vinted, which, you know, one's German, uh, one's based in London and the U.S., one is, another one is the U.S. And these companies are, you know, they're looking at startups every day, every week. They have, I went and visited the office of Insight, which is one of the companies, um, and I do a lot of business with Insight. I went and visited their office, and they have scores of analysts you know, you walk out, you, you think you're in like almost an investment firm because there's scores of analysts just, you know, lining the things. And so I went around to the analysts and I basically asked them, you know, what, what do they do? What, what is your daily, what is a day in your life? So every day these analysts are looking, for the, looking at startups around the world to find a viable startup for this company to put their, their fund money in. They're on their about eighth or ninth fund. And each fund is worth, you know, I don't know, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars that these, these guys do. And they're very successful at finding, identifying, you know, a company that has potential and putting hundreds of millions of dollars in it. And then that seems so daunting before to me. It, it used to seem something like that seems so impossible. Like when you hear these stories about people, they, they wrote a business plan or they started a business and next thing you know, you know, you, you've seen the Facebook story, you've all seen the Google story where you've, you started this, you had this idea, and you, you hear about someone putting 20 million into something, 50 million, and you hear about this wild success they had. 
and a lot of people, like myself, w w is very like, wow, that's so far-fetched. That's so, you know, that's not my reality. I don't, that's not, you know, but it really can be. And then that's what Beats showed me. Beats showed me that anything is possible, that all it takes is an idea. And then maybe you, meet, you might have to go to your best friend or who's the smartest person you know, but you know, you, the, all it takes is an idea and it takes to have the, the, the balls, if you will, um, to, to, to believe in it, to move forward with it. So fast forward to working with this guy named Kanye West. So when I first started, this is a funny story. So I've known Kanye for years. The music business is really not that big. Um, I know this Middle Eastern billionaire, and he said, I like this guy, Kanye West. Um, he's trying to do something in clothing. I want to invest. I have $7 million I want to invest in his clothing line. So I said, he said, do you know him? I said, I do. I'll introduce you. So we go to meet with Kanye. He's putting on a fashion, he's preparing to put on a fashion show in Paris. This is his first fashion show in Paris. So I'm, I go meet him with him. We sit down. I said, I, you know, I have this guy who wants to meet you. He wants to invest in your clothing line. So Kanye being Kanye, Kanye did not have a business plan. Kanye did not have an infrastructure. Kanye did not have a clothing business. Kanye just was putting on a fashion show with his own money and his own, you know, and, you know, and so I was like, <laughs> so the, needless to say, the billionaire was like, I can't invest in him, Che. <laughs> I can't, like, he doesn't know anything of what he's doing. He, you know, I can't invest in him. So I said, I understand. So Kanye said, well, hey, I've got this record label. You want to help me with that? So I came involved. I got involved, started helping with the record label. But what I realized, it's the same thing that I learned from the Beats by Dre experience. I realized that this guy, he had something special in terms of his effect on culture, his influence on the youth, and not only the U.S. youth, the global youth. So I, you know, the more I was around him, the more infectious I learned that his personality was. Yes, it can rub people the wrong way, but he's out there. He's very, he's very, he's not afraid to put himself out there. And then I realized that's going to, that's going to be, one day that's going to be really powerful in a space of a, when you start putting a product out there. So same thing, we started looking around for, you know, whether it was going to be closed, how we were going to do it. He had a bad experience with Nike. Um, same thing, they gave him the little celebrity deal, which was a little small percentage. Um, and this is why I do really respect him. He knew his value. He knew his, his value in the marketplace. So he was not interested in like a celebrity royalty deal. He was only interested in a deal that would have ownership. So I had a relationship. I grew up with a guy. Um, which is funny, this is how Beats by Dre was named. Let me backtrack a little bit. I grew up with a guy who became a top executive at Reebok. Um, I went to college in, a, in an area called Hampton University in Virginia. And it's the same place Allen Iverson, I know you guys know basketball because you've got a lot of NBA players in Lithuania. Um, so this guy, Allen Iverson, played basketball there, who I met when we were in college. And then I also knew Todd, uh, who I grew up with, who was an executive at Reebok. So Todd and Reebok signed Allen Iverson early on. So I had this long-standing relationship with, with Reebok. And it turns out Reebok, along the way, was purchased by Adidas. So fast track, this is where these relationships come in handy and all this networking. Kanye's looking for a home. I say, well, what about Adidas? His first reaction is, I think they're corny. I said, well, I said, anything is corny, you know, you have to bring your, your ideas and, and you, your, you know, your, your mindset to the table and you have to partner with them and join them. So I convinced him to do a meeting with the CEO. Um, so I invited the CEO of Adidas to a concert. We were in, um, ooh, I think we were in Copenhagen. And I invited him to a concert. So the same thing, the CEO of Adidas is like, you know, we can't do business with this, this guy. This guy's out of control. He's you know, so Kanye's on one side, he's like, oh, I don't want to do business with them. And the CEO of Adidas is like, I don't know, this guy's crazy. I, I'm, I'm scared of him. 
So I get them together, they hang out. It actually goes well. Um, I've had other meetings with Kanye. I'll give you one funny one where we met about a headphone and then literally in the beginning of the meeting, he threw the headphones across the table and said, I don't care about headphones. So I didn't know how this Adidas meeting was gonna go. So we sat down. The first thing he says to the Adidas is he says, I don't like Adidas. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, so I stood up, made myself a drink. But what, what ensued was, was, a really, was a really fluid dialogue about um, what he thought he could bring to the market in footwear and what he brought, thought he could bring to the, to the market and bring to the world. And then the CEO of Adidas, what he, what he thought the culture, what he thought where, his, where he was trying to take Adidas and where he saw Adidas could be a, a global leader again and be one of the big, you know, it was already a huge, you know, huge brand, but it wasn't like, it wasn't popular with the kids anymore. It was losing, it was losing its, you know, its flavor with the kids. You know, Nike was beating them out in every, Nike and Vans were beating them out in every, in every um, thing, except for, except for football shoes, except for like soccer shoes. They were literally beating them in all lifestyle mark, you know, markets and so on and so forth. So I got them to just find a middle ground of conversation. And that conversation went on for a good six months. And they were able to reach, I was very surprised, but they were able to finally reach some starting point of an agreement. But I knew that all we needed to do is if we could close some deal, that once we created something, that I knew his influence on culture would take over from there. So I just needed to you know, really just nurture the relationship to get the initial deal done. So we got the deal done. Then Kanye being Kanye, he sources materials from all around the world. So, you know, there's materials from Portugal. There's, you know, souls from this part of the world. And obviously in sneaker manufacturing, that's not necessarily the best idea. So. We, we, we get ready to launch the sneaker. There's a demand of a, hundred, of a million orders. We're only able to deliver 9,000. Um, so, you know, but that ended up being a good thing because that just made people want them even more. That made the, you know, that made the demand stronger. That made, that made the eBay resale value market go crazy. So now you started having these sneakers that were, you know, cost $200 being resold for thousands of dollars. And, you know, I wish I would love to say that that was planned, but we actually were trying to meet more of the demand, you know, we wanted to, but now we're doing better with sourcing and things of that nature and we can meet the demand. But long story short, it's the same thing. We created this product that we knew, his, well, we took advantage of his impact as a personality, as a, as, a, as a celebrity, but beyond just a celebrity deal, because everyone can pay a celebrity to market a product. Does it work? Sometimes it works better than others. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Um, I think the public can see through what's contrived. They can see through what's real and what's phony. And I think we, we've always come from a place where it's, it's definitely really authentic, where, where, where we really in, we're really part of the culture. You know, and that's where the music side of it really helps because we're really, you know, we really work with the youth. We're not, we don't, you know, when we're talk, when we're creating a product, there's as many, you would be surprised at the amount of young people that have input, you know, that people that, you know, he'll ask anybody. He'll ask a kid, a 17-year-old kid who looks, who, who Kanye will be like, oh, that's a cool shirt. It's a cool shirt. What do you think of these sneakers? Because he wants, you know, it's really, it's really the youth that influence what we do. And then, and then we go from there and we create products that we, you know, we find a, a really good business model to market and bring it to the world. Um, now, tying that back into Lithuania, I think, I love the idea that you're creating this conference where it's, okay, we're going to create this conference where we're going to talk about opportunities and growing businesses and startups out of Lithuania and I think, and out of the Baltic states. And a lot of people I think are wondering like, how do I enter the US market or how do I, you know, expand out of this market? Um, 
first and foremost, it obviously starts with what business you're doing and what product you have. Um, I'm gonna use Vinted as an example because it's the business I'm involved in. It's the business I'm, I'm on, the, on, the, on the board of. And it's a business that I believe that I could bring value to it, expanding it into the U.S. market. Um, Vinted is a, is, a, is a clothing resale app. But beyond that, it's also somewhat of a social community that is the target audience is 14 to 24-year-old women. And the target audience in music, when we create music, is 14 to 24-year-old women. So you see the synergy right there, right off the bat. So you see my interest. Um, the social aspect of Vinted in the app, the social platform is what's great because it's a conversation about fashion. It's a conversation about music. It's a conversation about boys and relationships and all those things. All the amazing, valuable information for someone that creates music and creates products and creates things. But what it's so interesting about them is their ideas are really a global idea. But from each region they go into and each country they go into, there's, there's nuances to that, to that country. So what works in Paris may not work in Italy. What works in Italy may not work in the U.S. What works in the U.S. may not work in Scandinavia. So there's nuances to it. So those are the things that, as you launch a business, you're going to have to know who you're marketing to and the nuances of entering that market. You know, there's, it's a different everywhere you go. Um, we found that, you know, obviously in France, where they're a very fashion-forward country, certain things are more important to them. They're looking for more unique high-end products, whereas in other places, they're looking for really good value. And, and it, it's this information that is, is so valuable to, to the business that you're creating or that you're starting. Um, for me, it's fascinating traveling the world because everywhere I go, music is consumed differently. Um, the speaker before us, Nicholas, brought up Spotify, which is an amazing business to me because, you know, I think it's, it's another example of someone being out of market, if you will. He's not, he's not from the U.S. He was able to look at the business of the music business, even, even if it was, you know, I don't know if he realized how big Spotify, how big the idea was initially, um, but it was a, you know, his idea was rather than this money, this, 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 this huge amount of money that gets lost to music piracy, what if that, some of that was monetized? I, I believe these people that are downloading it, if given the opportunity, would actually pay you know, would pay and support these artists. So he came up with this brilliant idea. And it's amazing to me that people outside of the music business have the, are the ones that come up with these revolutionary ideas, a la iTunes, Spotify, Napster. And they're able to look at the music business. It's kind of like looking at a chessboard from the side. You know, when you're immersed in the business, sometimes you don't see, you see, your, you know, you're, where you're headed. But someone who looks at the, the business from the side sees something different than you see. And I thought Spotify is a brilliant example of taking a product from a region and making it a global, global business. Because he was able to initially, okay, cool, it worked in Scandinavia, but it wasn't necessarily received the same way. It was, it was resisted in the U.S. for a while. And it was like, okay, well, let's, how, do, how, do we, how do we modify to work in the U.S.? How do we make it appealing to the U.S.? Well, you make it appealing to the kids. You make it appealing to the youth. Once you get the youth, and they really focused on that market, that 14 to 24 market. And, and if you look at all the streaming services today, Spotify dominates that market. They really focused on that age bracket, you know, and that's how they were successful. So I really think, so any business that you create, whether it's from here, from Scandinavia, or even from the U.S. trying to come here, it's really about understanding the market that you're entering and then how do, how do I enter that market? How do I compete within that market? And then how, do, how am I successful within that? I think it's really under the, the cultural nuances of entering someone's market, you really have to understand. And I think that's one of the things that we've been successful for. I mean, it helps with the music, don't get me wrong. The music is all obviously how we, if the music, if we know the music is already working in Japan, then we know we have a market in Japan, you know? So any place where, where we're not, successful if the mu you know we try to take the music there first and that's that's the avenue i use but you know i think in in vintage's case they have a brilliant idea they have a brilliant product 
and it's just about, okay, how do, we, how do we enter this market and then how do we compete within this market? How do we, how do we service this market correctly? You know, in the German market where they're very successful, uh, their, their Series C funding came from the Berta Group, which is the German media group. So now they're able to leverage this platform within the German market. So now you have this German media conglomerate that can help leverage their platform to, to be successful in Germany. So I think it's these sorts of strategic partnerships that you make along the way with your business that is the way that you really, you know, meaning maybe you have to do, maybe if you're trying to enter the, you know, the British market, you hire a British PR firm. You don't just think one PR firm can just service everybody. You know, you hire, I have a new artist named Casey Hill who we, who we launched. She, you know, right off the bat when we first put her out there and just threw a little information out there, we had a lot of feedback that she looked European, that she looked like a model. So my natural thing was, okay, cool, we need to put her out in London first. So we hired a British PR firm. You know, she's from Arizona, but everyone thinks that she was from Europe. You know, it's, it's, it's strategy, it's strategic. It's very seeding how we marketed. You know, we knew she looked like a model, so we engaged Vogue early, and we, we, we pitched her to Vogue. We pitched her music to that place. So you really work to what your business strengths are. You really try to, you know, you really emphasize those strengths. And then you really, and you're very strategic about how you enter a market, how you're successful in that market, and how you expand. Um, I know I'm a little all over the place, so I want to bring it back to make sense. I just have so much I want to say. So, if we, you know, I'm enjoying being here with you guys. That it, it excites me to see businesses and startups from all around the world um, being successful and growing and making an impact and being in the U.S. market and so on and so forth. Um, I spend time with Daniel, the founder of Spotify, and we were supposed to initially meet for 15 minutes, and we ended up meeting for two and a half hours. And the meeting was not even about the music business. The meeting was about, we ended up meeting, and it ended up being about life, and it about being about culture and family, and, and it ended up being about how we can utilize tech and utilize innovation and, and, then, and then create products to make people be able to enjoy their lives better versus, you know, I, a lot of things are solutions, you know, people try to find a better way to do something, a better way to listen to music, a better way to consume this, you know, a faster way to buy stuff where you can, okay, I can just go to Netflix and watch a movie, I can just go to Amazon and buy products. It, you know, a, a lot of it is about, you know, just immediate gratification. but. Those products to me that are about like enhancing someone's life and quality of life, I think that's, that's great because so for instance, Spotify, you know, at the core of it, there's two real core things of it. He wanted to help musicians that were losing money. Obviously he still wanted to create a business, but the other thing is he also wanted to bring music to people again, where people just had, you know, just had really easy access to music, you know, where it was really at your fingertips where it was really at your phone, it was here, you didn't have to, you know, download music, you know, that, that, there's a process to downloading. And a lot of us didn't want to download. I was never a big downloader. I still, you know, preferred going to a record store and buying a record or a CD. I was never a huge fan of iTunes, although it was, you know, obviously insanely successful. Um, and brilliant at the same time. I had to respect that it was a brilliant business because he cornered the market and said, you're going to pay me 30%, 30 percent, and you, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, I think that was brilliant because he was like, I'm the biggest, you know, you know, I'm the biggest record store on the block, so you got to pay me 30 percent, and there's nothing, you know, you can't do about it. You know, Kanye with this last album, he tried to not put it on Apple. That didn't work. <laughs> we still ended up putting it on Apple. <laughs> But what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is it's not really so much where you're from. It's really more about what you can do with your idea. It's, it's about who you can bring, who you can get involved with, who you can network with, who you can 
how do you take that idea and grow it from, from one person to three people to five people to ten people believing in the idea? It's sort of building your own armies. You're building your own teams. It's building your, you know, and rallying people around you with your spirit to believe in what you're passionate about. Um, it is utilizing innovation because they're tools for you. They're tools for you to do things better. Like, you know, right now there's a company in Helsinki I'm looking at. It's an amazing company. Um, I play multiple instruments, but it's actually teaching me how to play an instrument better. Um, a company called Musician. Um, it, you know, it's out of Finland, you know. And there are a lot of companies that have, um, teach you how to play guitar and this one. They just do it better, you know. And, it's, and they're, they're from Finland and they're, you know, by the end of the year they'll probably have 25 million users. You know, they, they have the, a, a tremendous user growth rate because word of mouth is taking over for them. The product is so good that people are telling five people about it and they're telling their friends about it and so on and so forth. So if you create these, 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 pro, these, you know, these businesses, these products, and you're utilizing, you're looking forward, you know, I think the opportunity is, you know, endless. You're not, you're not, you're not a prisoner to where you're at, to your limitations. You know, I think the, the, the world is a, is a big place, you know, and you don't have to conquer the world, you can just conquer a piece of it, you know? It's like Genghis Khan. Um, I wish it was, I wish, I know there's no questions, there's too many people for questions and so forth, and I'll answer questions after, but um, I wanted to wrap up by really saying that the success of a business is really upon how much you put into it and, 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 you, and being intelligent with it. Obviously, um, you know, the market can change, things can happen that crash, you know. Uh, if you had a product and the factory goes down, there's things that, there are what I call God things that happen that you can't control. But the things you can control are the things that make a, that make a business successful. Those, those are the, that's the way that you really, you can move your idea forward. Um, and and, and it, is, it does take a lot of belief in, in oneself. Um, I don't want to get all spiritual on you guys or anything like that, but I do think it really starts there. It really starts with being, being you know, a, have, a, have each of you having a little Kanye West in you. You know, he's got enough confidence for everybody. But I take from those guys, like what I really respect about Kanye and Diddy is that they have the confidence in themselves to tell everybody they're great, you know, and then go out and prove it, hopefully, hopefully prove it. But it's that, it's that self-belief that you, you got to start there. You have to believe in yourself. And then from there, you know, anything is possible. Um, and with that, I'm pretty much done. Thank you.